so my next presentation and my paper were about energy law and national security, how they um, how they intermingle, how they overlap, um, and what issues are um, arising in that area where they do overlap. So really quickly, I was just going to go over the basic definitions. So this whole semester we've been learning about energy law. So what is it? Um, it seeks to understand and control the regulation, transportation, distribution of energy, energy-related materials. And from this class, you learn it's affected by our advancements in technology, by our law, by our relationships to other countries, by our everyday lives, pretty much. And national security covers the actions directly concerned with the nation's safety and protecting us from the risk of harm. And so first, I'm going to go over um, energy security, and this kind of shows you sort of what it is. It's this area that um, involves economic security or national security, the environment, um, and kind of a, a good definition to start with is it's a condition in which a nation um, has access to sufficient energy resources at reasonable prices um, for the foreseeable future, free from major disruption of service. I got that from one of the professors on his other books, <laughs> which he didn't read in here, but it was very helpful. And um, so energy security can be long term, it can be short term, it has different time dimensions. Um, you know, like how do you deal with your power going out for the night because of a storm or something? That's a short term energy security um, problem. Or long term, how do you deal with climate change, with um, global warming? And it can also um, deal with the individual, or it can be um, the broader group. So you can look at the viewpoint of how does someone pay their energy bills, and if they can't afford certain things, if they can't afford certain sources, or how do you look at the entire country as a whole and what we're purchasing, and can we as a country afford certain sources? And so developing countries are especially at risk of these kind of security issues um, turning violent when their sources become scarce. Um, especially when that comes to things like water, and it's been said that the next world war will likely be fought over water because that is such a crucial source. And things like climate change and our overconsumption of water are threatening to deplete that source. And so um, once things like water become difficult to find, it can be much harder for um, developing countries to just move to another source because they're not as economically stable, so they can't just all of a sudden change to a whole new um, source of money that occurs with the United States. Plan. And the United States also faces this you know, interesting chance of being called upon to intervene in a developing country where a situation like you know, resources have become scarce, where there's violence, the state is collapsing under the pressure of these energy security issues, they can't provide for their citizens. Um, so we could be called upon to intervene in a situation like that um, with our military. So I'm also going to just quickly talk about nuclear as well, because that's another area where these two overlap. I won't get into it too much. I don't want to steal <laughs> Julian's thunder. Um, but about 20% of our energy is generated by nuclear currently. And one of the biggest hazards is um, the undesired release of radiation. And so we have this huge fear that we can 100% prevent another Fukushima or Chernobyl or Three Mile Island, and um, that creates a very um, widespread fear that we don't want to really rely on nuclear. Um, and so that starts to tie in these national security issues of protecting us from the risk of harm, protecting <coughs> public health and safety. But another really interesting part of it is that nuclear is one of the only energy sources that can also produce large-scale weapons. And we know that the U.S. currently has a monopoly on nuclear weapons for now, and we hope for now. <laughs> but there is no single international treaty that explicitly bans the use of them. Um, they just sort of circumscribe the aspects of possession, of use of them. But because there is still sort of this wiggle room, um, some states sometimes can signal the use of their, um, or the possession of nuclear arms for self-defense purposes. So if another state um, they feel is violating their territorial integrity, or their political independence, they can sort of use that as a self-defense mechanism. They don't actually have to use them, just say, I have them. Don't mess with me. <laughs> and one of the biggest ones is oil. Um, so in 2013, about, um, I got about 36% of our energy was from oil and petroleum. 
And comes as no surprise, the Middle East um, has more oil reserves than anywhere else in the world. And oil is the most dominant energy source in the world, not just in the US. Um, and we know that these areas also um, have a lot of political instability. They've historically engaged in some policies that are detrimental to our interests. And so because it's such a dominant ener energy source and there's such a high demand for it, um, a spike in oil prices can be a catalyst for a weak global economy. So the United States, as well as any other um, country dependent on oil, has an interest in maintaining peace with these countries and helping them maintain peace on their own um, in order to aid the global economy and keep it stable. And um, political uprisings in these areas, such as the one in Libya, that we probably all remember, um, can just rock the global oil market. And um, I just grabbed a quote from President Obama stating, we will keep on being a victim to shifts in the oil market until we get serious about long-term policy for secure, affordable energy. <clears throat> and we also saw last year that there's a, start, a sharp drop in oil prices, resulting mostly from um, these high prices, so no one wants to pay those high prices, so they started encouraging um, lower oil consumption, searches for different sources, and so um, hopefully this means that our oil um, consumption will continue to decrease, and we'll continue searching for these other sources, um, alternatives, and uh, renewable sources. And one of my favorite parts of my paper is piracy. <laughs> so, um, so um, nearly 50% of our oil supply in the world is transported via ship. Um, so the waterways and transportation routes that are used to transport um, oil have become more and more dangerous. They become more expensive um, due to modern piracy. And so modern piracy has an economic effect, it has an environmental effect, a political one, um, it can threaten national security, it has this sort of very fine line between piracy and terrorism. And so far in uh, 2015, there have been 37 reported piracy attacks against maritime vessels. And the cost of piracy can reach well into the billions, so it absolutely has an economic effect. And just to show you this quick map that I got from National Geographic kind of shows right around um, this area, like the Horn of Africa, you can see there's been a lot of attempted piracies. Um, the Gulf of Aden is a very dangerous area, um, as well as um, this area. And then this came from um, the International Chamber of Commerce. So this is from 2015. And so you can see the same thing. There's still um, quite a few there. I was surprised that there were less at least reported ones. I'm not sure if that's just something about the reporting. Maybe there's not as many getting um, reported. Um, but there's still a lot here. Um, so it is, it's still very common. So there's, there our air is called flash points and choke points. Um, some of you may already know about them from like if you take an international law or maritime or oceans law. And so choke points are these, um, they're narrow sea lanes that are susceptible to, to disruption from piracy, from robbery. So those sorts of areas like the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden. Um, so they have that name because they can easily um, choke off these vessels that are trying to get through that route. And then can also, at least temporarily, cut off the energy supply that's being transported that way. And then Flashpoint is very similar, except it's less specific to a waterway. So that is a situation or a place or a point where uh, anger and violence can um, quickly erupt. So. Some of these areas are also sort of symbolic flashpoints for um, political issues happening between countries. And so the US military has a huge interest in protecting these waterways as well as in other countries. However, um, the military is expected to protect our nation from harm, protect access to energy and oil, but are they using more energy than they're actually protecting? Because the Department of Defense is our largest fuel user in the US. So they're expected to power ships and vehicles, aircrafts, um, ground operations, so they can be very vulnerable to oil spikes as well, more so almost than the rest of the country. So, and moving so much oil around as well can make them vulnerable um, and make them a target for terrorism or pirates. So that's a quote from the Department of Defense, that maintaining a military that's ready for missions everywhere means it's vital to use energy better and use better energy. So they are trying to invest in uh, New energy sources. I haven't 
really see anything about moving far away from oil, but maybe <coughs> we'll see. <laughs> and actually, so that's also from the International Chamber of Commerce. As I said, they have this thing called the Piracy Reporting Center. Um, so they follow the definition of piracy from um, when close the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and it's a non-government agency that um, it allows this reporting service for shipmates to report any piracy or robbery or attacks. And it's this like 24/7 like hotline pretty much. And um, if you go to their website, you can find these sorts of maps, and you can actually click on each of the little um, dots, and it gives you just a brief little blurb about the report. It tells you what kind of vessel it was. Tells you what happened, if it was hijacked, if it was boarded, if it was an attempted attack, um, if there was any hostages, things like that. So it's pretty interesting. And then I'm also going to mention fracking because that's sort of changing the picture of our oil dependency. And um, as we learned from well, this presentation, <laughs> large volumes of shale gas have become available that we previously thought we couldn't get access to. And, um, the EIA is estimating that our production will continue to rise for at least the, the next two decades. Um, so this opens the door for us to depend less on foreign oil and start um, getting our own, potentially become an exporter. However, strong criticism is the potential environmental effects, the health effects, especially contamination of drinking water. And so that happens because of spills or leaks, poorly constructed wells. So there needs to be this balancing of interest between, you know, the economic effects, this could lessen our dependence, we should become, you know, energy independent. However, there are health concerns, there are environmental concerns, which one is more important to us? We have to weigh this. And so, kind of looking to the future, we know that for us, for our allies, for our trading partners, every problem kind of comes down to an energy problem. And all of our energy choices, and the implications of climate change are going to reach far and wide and affect us in more ways than we can even realize. So this includes limited access to fresh water, drinking water, which we're already starting to see, loss of farmable land, so less access to food, violent weather, strong, stronger natural disasters. Once again, we're starting to already see some of that. And that can result in the loss of life, large population displacement. Um, that can result in mass migration, including in tow our own country, which can result in national security issues inside our borders, outside our borders. And um, the most common critique is that our energy policy is not sustainable, and that comes in two forms, that we're not environmentally sustainable and we're not economically sustainable. And so one proposed solution that I saw was moving generation of energy closer to home, so you cut down on the distance that it has to travel, you cut down um, the environmental impact that it has, you cut down the cost, so we don't have to move it as far. And one of the things that I thought of was from Kevin's presentation about geothermal, uh, but we know that for many sources, almost every source, there's these limitations, so there are geological limitations to that, not everyone can rely on things like geothermal, um, so it's, it's going to take a lot of different sources. But the national security risks associated with solar, wind, geothermal, those are far fewer than oil and nuclear. And I also thought even just the fact that we call them alternatives, I've noticed, seems kind of like a language issue that it, it shows that we're kind of <coughs> resistant to even moving towards them. They're alternatives. They're not just renewables. Um, but the negative side effects of non-renewables mean we are going to have to make that shift eventually. There's just a debate about how soon. And also, could international treaty law be something moving forward that could help us? Um, the Kyoto Protocol, as we've seen, um, has sort of started that. So um, in case um, some of you don't remember, don't know, the Kyoto Protocol is this international agreement linked to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So it's aimed at reducing our um, carbon emissions, stabilizing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The US has signed it, but we didn't ratify it meaning that we're not actually bound by its terms, and we're pretty much the only major country that did not ratify it. It was a little strange. So hopefully that at least means that moving forward we can see what the Kyoto has done right, what it's done wrong, what its successor may look like, and we can develop a better treaty, one that the U.S. will hopefully sign, 
and show that we're willing to foster these global policies aimed at um, you know, being sustainable environmentally and economically. And is there any safe energy source trade-off for us to make? Um, because there are these national security issues. Is there something we should be moving <coughs> towards, moving away from? And I think it's been really clear from everyone's presentations in this whole semester that there is no one perfect energy source that will solve all of our problems. Um, every major source has a drawback, it has a limitation. So it's going to take multiple sources, it's going to take a variety to reduce our dependence on more oil and fossil fuels and start shifting our, fo our focus more towards being sustainable and fostering our own ener energy security as well as global energy security. And to be able to do this in a realistic way, it's going to take the cooperation of multiple agencies, multiple departments, multiple branches, um, you know, the Department of Energy, Department of the Interior, the EPA, Department of Defense, they all have an interest in this and they all will have to sort of see where they overlap and what they can do better and what they can work on together. And the lack of political consensus and the lack of sort of concrete policies has also been a roadblock to developing this kind of a plan already. So those are things that um, will need to be worked on in the future as well. And so, sort of wrapping some of it up, it's really obvious that energy law and national security overlap in many ways they intersect, um, and it affects our global economics, it affects our local economics, our environment, um, our foreign policy. So, developing this kind of a comprehensive and sustainable approach is what will be best for the United States moving forward. And I read a lot too about how energy law tends to circulate around sort of disasters and things like that. That's when we start looking at our energy law, our energy policies, this really terrible thing happened. There's this um, public attention surrounding it. So the time to do it is really before any kind of natural disasters or huge accidents um, because future generations are relying on us to come up with these energy sources that will last longer than just our lifetimes, they want energy security, not just um, for the individual in the short term, but for the entire group in the long term. Any questions? <laughs> Well, I'll throw a couple of comments in. <laughs> a very nice big picture look at everything that's wrapped in here. Um, one of the pieces of energy security, the United States side, as Annie mentions, we tend to be thinking, we're going to be running short of something. There's an oil shortage, whatever, whatever, and how do we deal with this? And from any number of other countries' perspectives, energy security is, as we're a major exporter of fill in the blank. Suppose something like that changes. An obvious example right now is, in the last few years, is Russia. Here we are sitting, 90% of their foreign trade income is oil and gas. And suddenly the price drops catastrophically and or they get sanctions imposed on them following uh, Crimea and, and Ukraine. And their economy, not real great even before then, is suddenly in just disaster state. And so you, you take it in both of those directions. And then the other thought on the nuclear weapons uh, side of life, while the United States is certainly uh, probably the strongest total nuclear weapons power, uh, I think by best current estimates, uh, Russia, China, Britain, <coughs> France, Israel, although Israel still does not officially claim that they have nuclear weapons there, Pakistan, India, and I'm forgetting whether I'm leaving one out, has nuclear capability and certainly explains how crucial the Iranian decision that we are still struggling through, where do we want to play with all of this, uh, is likely to leave us. And I guess any time I, I see somebody saying, well, of course countries should give up their nuclear option, that's stupid that they have it, we don't want all sorts of small countries or dictator-run countries having their own nuclear weapon. From the perspective of the nuclear uh, weapon country, you're kind of saying, who is, who is smarter off in this? If, if you look at some of the bad dictatorships of some years back, 
One, there is Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Uh, secondly, there is Gaddafi in Libya. Third, there is which of the generation of uh, Kims in North Korea. And who probably has survived the best out of that? Answer, North Korea. Any reason why? Well, they've got nuclear capability. And you can imagine where the Iraq wars would have been if Saddam Hussein did have nuclear weapons capability. And you could say as a matter of we got more bombs than they do, yeah, no doubt about that. But all they need is to send off one or two of those and all kinds of things change. And that's a real, you know, you, you hate to say it, but that's a, that's a diplomatic and military game changer. And are we going to take on a country with nuclear weapons? Oh, wow, maybe they're smart enough that they are not going to fire it off, but we're not sure of that. And I was reading that at least the United States and Russia both keep their nuclear weapons like on high alert. I think it's called 24-7, and they're always yeah. on high alert. I'm not sure if any other countries do. They're concerned wrapped up in that, you know, that there could be some kind of false warning or an accident or a mistake yeah. of some kind that could send those off. Yeah. And I think of Britain as they're going into their election, uh, what, the next three weeks or so, uh, with all of the talk of Britain has become now such a second-rate power and they've withdrawn from everything that traditionally they were. Uh, could you get a British consensus to, we should give up a British nuclear option? We feel comfortably enough protected by the United States, if God knows it comes to that. Um, my best guess is probably they wouldn't, but I think that would be a contentious, valid issue. Do you think the concern about terrorism now is more along the lines of traditional terrorist attack, like blowing things up, or, or do you think it's sort of evolved to, you know, a digitized terrorism, hacking into infrastructure, hacking into power plants, and shutting them down? I would bet that any smart terrorist group would probably utilize both. Um, I think probably some kind of digital hacking and stuff makes us vulnerable, but depending on the right area, such as, you know, our vessels and things like that, um, if you did them at the same time, that would make us even more vulnerable, cut off our energy source while also hacking into our digital sources. Anything else? Do you get any sense, uh, you mentioned like piracy and terrorism and such and, and kind of building up at that point. Is, is there any sense like with our ports specifically with so many vessels coming in that there are terrorist concerns there or did you, did you come across that in your paper at all? I didn't find any research about ones coming into our ports really or issues with that. Um, mostly concerns over our vessels in other areas having left other ports or things like that. Um, when they're out on the high seas and there is no protection out there. I saw more of that. I didn't read anything about in our own, but that's a really good thing to look into. And I think we, we the government, is trying to keep that very quiet, but yeah, that's a concern. It's very, like, history channel. Like, <laughs> yeah. <disasters>. Yeah. <laughs> I probably have to go ask like Professor Norky about that. <laughs> and you think of all of the presentations, and here is the way this energy resource is distributed, and there are so many attack points if you are wanting to shut things down. And part of the genius of the growth of the energy realm is we can be extracting something, and 2,000 miles away we are generating the power, and that power then goes out at another 1,000 miles somewhere. But those are a lot of very sensitive attack points. If somebody wants to say, how do I really do some damage uh, to the United States? And possibly in ways that you wouldn't be able to identify. <clears throat> Here's something that's happened that has blown up some major uh, electric interconnections. Well, who did it? Nobody jumps forward immediately and claims that they did possibly. And you then pick the three favorite enemies and say, okay, atomic bomb goes off over fill in the blank of the country, but I don't think we're going to do that. And the concern with that might also be we might not notice it for a little while, too, yeah. and some of the stuff about our nuclear weapons yeah. containing, you know, <laughs> mistakes or accidents, some things we don't even notice for a little while due to human error, you yeah. know, something can be unaccounted for for several hours before someone 
notices it or doesn't realize where the error came from. Mm -hmm. so. Hey, good job. Thank you. Yeah. Speaking of nuclear. So I did my paper this semester on the United States and its nuclear energy policy. Um, so just the scope of what I did. Um, I did a brief overview. There's so much to talk about in this subject. Um, so I just did a brief overview of different parts of it, um, beginning with the nuclear process, um, a <coughs> overview of the United States uh, and its commercial nuclear activities. Um, I went over the legal and regulatory structure, and then I talked at length about the disposal of nuclear waste, and in particular Yucca Mountain. Uh, so at the core of the, the nuclear process is uranium. Um, it's a common metal that's found uh, throughout the world in rocks and in the ground. Um, it's actually in nature 100 times more common than silver. Uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Canada, and Australia are the three primary producers of uranium in the world. Uh, the United States also produces its fair share amount. And in the U.S. it's found predominantly in the Midwest, uh, in the Western part. Um, the most naturally occurring isotope of uranium is U-238, um, but that is not preferred uh, in the nuclear process because it's uh, pretty stable. And so U-235 is the preferred isotope because during fission, um, where the uranium atom is split apart um, and the chain reaction starts, uh, it's less stable and so it's easier to um, split apart. Um, and that is, the picture there is actually a piece of highly enriched uranium. Um, weapons grade. Uh, this is, I'm not going to get too deep into this, but this is just how the process works. Uh, first you have your mining, uh, it can be long shaft or open pit mining. Um, and then it goes to conversion. Uh, in between there, it, there's one more stop where you guys probably heard of yellow cake. Um, so yellow cake happens and that is brought to a conversion facility where it's turned into UF6, which is uranium hexafluoride gas. Um, once the UF6 is made, at this point it's about 0.707% uh, U235, so it goes to a uranium enrichment facility. The only way that we do that in the United States is through gases diffusion, and we have one plant in Paducah. Kentucky, where that is done. Um, there are some wastes that is uh, 
So once the UF6 is made, it's put into canisters. Um, there's tail storage, which is just waste from the uranium. Uh, the, the UF6 canisters are brought to fuel fabrication facilities, and there the UF6 is compressed into a, uh, kind of like a ceramic pellet, and they are compiled into tubes, which are called fuel rods, and those tubes are put together to call uh, fuel assemblies. And in the fuel assembly, there's not many moving parts um, except a couple control rods, and the fuel assemblies are then brought to the power reactor and they're put, up, they're put in when uh, they are needed. Uh, the U.S. typically, a typical reactor will replace um, their fuel about every 18 to 24 months. Um, and then as the cycle continues, you have your immediate spent fuel waste and then there is some reprocessing that you can do and traditionally how nuclear weapons were produced was through this, so you would reprocess the, the spent uranium and then recover the plutonium, which would be used for nuclear weapons. And if you're interested in the Iranian debacle, uh, this is this part in particular is a really <coughs> uh, huge focus in terms of how many fuel rods and fuel assemblies they have, um, and because that in turn dictates how many of that can, how much of that can be reprocessed into uh, weapons grade plutonium. Uh, so in the United States, as he said, it accounts for about 20% of all power, uh, or all electricity. Um, that's generated by 61 commercial uh, generating stations with 99 total reactors. Uh, our oldest reactors are, were brought in 1969 in Oyster Creek and Nine Mile Point One, both in New York, New Jersey. Uh, the newest reactor is in Tennessee, Watts Bar Unit 1. That was in 96, and then the second unit, Unit 2, is going to open either late this year or early next year. Um, unit 2 is pretty interesting. Uh, about 80% of that construction was complete, um, and then they stopped. And so they just reinitiated, and this was back in like the late 80s. Um, and then so they just reinitiated this. Uh, so this is just a map, um, and what I think is Particularly interesting is if you notice where the power plants were located, um, not just how the heavy concentration over here, but look at the major metropolitan areas that are around. You have in New York, of course, Chicago, um, Charlotte, Atlanta. Um, so it's just, it, from a waste perspective, it's unique because as of now, since we don't have a permanent repository, uh, spent fuel is stored at those reactor sites. So. Um, I'll circle back to that later when I talk about security. Um, just you know, some interesting facts about uh, you know nuclear power in the United States. Um, this just happened. Vermont Yankee a few uh, months ago was began the process of decommissioning, um, and like I said, Watts Bar Unit Two <coughs> is the next one on deck, um, and then the largest reactor actually is in Mississippi. Illinois comes in with 11 total nuclear reactors, so the largest in the country. Um, so getting into the, the legal and regulatory structure, um, basically the, the granddad of all nuclear legislation is the Atomic Energy Act, passed in 1946, um, and this really started the research and development of nuclear power and um, recognized weapons, I guess, to an official extent. Of course, we had the clandestine Manhattan Project well before that. Um, we established the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, which was tasked with implementing licensing protocols and it, through, their, through its regulatory authority. Um, the Energy Reorganization Act of 1974, um, this formally established the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which still exists to this day. And this actually bifurcated the oversight and governance of the civilian and military <coughs> nuclear programs. So the NRC was solely, solely responsible for the oversight and uh, regula regulatory uh, authority over the civilian sector. And the what is now the Department of Energy, uh, the Energy Research and Development Administration was tasked uh, with the oversight of the military sector. Um, Department of Energy Organization Act and it was passed in 1977 and this replaced the ERDA with the DOE and really served to consolidate um, 
all of the federal uh, energy entities under one central agency. Um, but at the same time, it left the role and structure of the NRC in place. Um, and then there's some other the environmental pieces. Uh, the EPA um, has the authority to uh, set environmental safety standards um, for the development, use, and disposal of nuclear materials. And the NEPA is particularly important um, in licensing and relicensing protocols. So there's a two-step licensing procedure pursuant to CFR uh, Part 50 to um, basically construct and then operate a new reactor in the United States. Um, so the first part is to apply for a construction permit with the NRC, and they will review um, the initial application with specific analysis for safety, environment, and antitrust concerns, and it's actually interesting, the, the initial license that's um, granted to a nuclear power plant uh, to operate is a 40-year period. And that period was um, pretty much solely chosen for antitrust considerations, um, which I think is interesting. It's, it's safety, I guess, isn't that big of, uh, not that it's not an issue, it's just that it's been done continuously throughout um, the lifetime of the reactor. So, um, but I think it's interesting that they do put an economic viewpoint on it. Um, so the utility company will submit an application with a safety analysis or report detailing um, the specific designs of the reactor, how they would react to potential hypothetical disaster situations, um, and they would also include um, and, and, and uh, trust information that was required. Um, the NRC would review this application and they'll specifically look at, um, I didn't put it in here, but it's, uh, the, they'll look at the population around the, uh, the proposed site, um, the different zones that um, a, a potential hazardous event could affect. Um, they'll look at um, economic concerns and other environmental concerns in terms of endangered species and such. Um, then they'll do a complete environmental review um, with NEPA, and the uh, NRC will conduct an environmental um, impact statement, and then they'll conduct public hearings for the construction event. It's not required for the operating license, but sometimes they will conduct those. And that's the basic two-part licensing step for uh, operating um, a reactor. Uh, so to renew, um, it goes along two streams. Again, it's environmental and safety. Uh, the new license is good for about 20 years. Um, it's voluntary, so you're not compelled to renew by statute. Um, and individual companies will often sometimes make the decision not to renew their license um, just based on economic concerns. It might be uh, Maine Yankee, for example. Uh, the safety, they had so many safety issues that it was just too expensive to uh, it wasn't cost effective to repair. Um, that, the average renewal process takes about 30 months or so, um, and there's been a pretty good success rate of applicants. Um, 42 have been granted, um, 11 are pending, one has been withdrawn. Um, even though the success rate has so far been pretty good, the recent applications dating back to about 2008, 2009, 2010, there's been significant lag time, and they've definitely surpassed the 30 month threshold. Um, Everything before that seemed to fall in line with about 30 months, and now we're approaching five, six, seven years in some instances. And then the story of American nuclear waste, um, I call it a justice system without prisons. Um, it's unfathomable to me that we have a fairly comprehensive nuclear strategy, policy, and program, except for the tail end of it. Um, on the left is what is today Maine Yankee. That's where, the, that's where this uh, high level radioactive waste is stored in this dry case. And then this is the opening to Yucca Mountain in Nevada. Um, so, just an overview of waste in our country. A uh, typical reactor will generate about 20 metric tons per year of waste. Um, we have about 70,000 metric tons of spent fuel for <clears throat> commercial reactors, and we do that at a rate of about 2,200 metric tons per year. Um, the military program, it's hard to get concrete information on that, but recent, most recent I could find about 2011, 2012, about 13 metric tons of waste. 
Um, and then our high-level radioactive waste is stored at about 35 locations across the United States. And then that's also in addition to low-level radioactive waste, which would be like um, gloves or clothing that was worn while handling radioactive uh, material. Those are stored at additional locations in the country. Some of the waste legislation um, in 1982, Congress basically said it's their sole responsibility to be the um, essential guardian of the permanent disposal of high-level radioactive waste um, in the United States, and they have not. They've pretty much ignored that so far. Um, 1985, for in terms of low-level radioactive waste, um, the states under NRC supervision can participate in that and establish regulatory protocols and oversight. Um, and then NEPA, uh, any repository construction has to comply with um, the provisions of NEPA. So in Yucca Mountain, um, it's located about 95 miles northwest of Las Vegas, Nevada. It's a six-mile long ridge. Um, goes about 1,200 feet. Um, it's on the southwest corner of the Nevada test site, which is a uh, former nuclear uh, testing range, and it's uh, also next to an Air Force base. And as you can see, it's you know it's relatively close to Las Vegas. Um, so just a timeline of Yucca Mountain. Um, so in 1982, we get the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, and Congress firmly says that it is the federal responsibility to be the uh, essential guardian of high-level nuclear waste. Um, 1983, the Department of Energy identified nine locations throughout the country um, as a short list to be studied for potential um, sites. It was reduced to three sites, uh, Yucca Mountain, Hanford, Washington, and then another location in Texas. Um, 1987, Congress comes and says we're only going to focus on studying the Yucca Mountain location. But then the official approval and designation didn't come until 2002. Um, and then six years later, the Department of Energy formally applies for a uh, construction license. And then two years later, the NRC at the direction of the Obama administration terminated the review. And in 2015, um, it's kind of a good question of where we're at. Um, actually, recently, like a month recently, there was a new bill um, <clears throat> put forth in Congress by uh, Lisa Murkowski, Lamar, <coughs> with Tennessee Brown. So, uh, basically, it was it's a it's a similar version of a bill um, from 2013, which proposes studying new sites and bringing a consent-based agreement. And part of, part of the problem with Yucca Mountain, of course, was the, the outrage from Nevada, um, and, you know, particularly the casino industry. And so they're looking for a more consent-based solution to uh, dealing with high-level radioactive waste. Uh, so some of the litigation that's occurred, occurred as a result of this, um, this is just a touch of it. Uh, so in Henry Aiken, um, the petitions argued that termination of the DOD application by the NRC um, of the Yucca Mountain construction site uh, was in violation of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. Um, and the court did an extraordinary thing. They actually granted a writ of mandamus, which is extremely um, rare for a court to do against the federal government, and uh, compelling the NRC to complete review of their application. Um, and this had been going on for right when DOE or NRC terminated review. Petitioners brought suit different utility companies and some state governments, including South Carolina and Washington. Uh, they brought suit right away, and the court gave them time after time after time over three years, and then finally they uh, they had enough. Um, and then in the next case, uh, petitioners brought suit claiming that the national the national utility fee charged to uh, nuclear power plants or utility companies should be set to zero until the government starts to comply with current law, which would be uh, continuing the Yucca Mountain or finding another site. Um, and the court actually, in knocking down the NRC's justification for not setting the fee to zero, 
they compared their analysis to the old Razzle Dazzle from the Chicago musical. And it, that's just a touch of the language. I've read a few cases over my three years, and I've never seen two court cases where they've come that hard at the federal government. <coughs> uh, the t you know, what's the problem? It's not a politically sexy issue to talk about. Um, it's, you know, high-level radioactive waste. It doesn't really generate a lot of enthusiasm or angst amongst uh, the Congress or the American public. Um, but at the same time, we also have our federal government willing, is willingly violating uh, federal law. Um, it's a huge economic issue. Um, it's inefficient to run this, this many repositories at different locations across the country and the different oversights in the multitude of entities from federal, state, and utility companies. Um, that can all be reduced and dramatically uh, kind of synthesized to make a more efficient system. And then, you know, circling back to the map, you know, where is the waste currently stored? It's stored at those, at the reactor sites, at the generating stations. You know, those sites are relatively close to major metropolitan areas. Um, said New York, Charlotte, Atlanta, Chicago, Miami, uh, Houston, Dallas. Um, you know, if the winds are going the right way and there's attack on one of those places, um, you know, probably a little bit harder to attack the Yucca Mountain than it would to pinpoint, you know, different, well, there's a variety of targets that they can pick. And so what to do? He says he's a nuclear moderate, I'm a nuclear realist. Um, it's here to stay, it's not going anywhere. It accounts for 20% of our electricity, it accounts for 75% of France's. Um, our military is integrating it in, ter in terms of using it for aircraft carriers, submarines. Um, it's, it's just, it's just not going to go anywhere. Um, as much as some people like to see it, it's just not going to happen. Um, and I really do think it's one of the most complex and troubling issues facing the nation right now. Um, there's an extreme amount of science involved and political wrangling, and it's something that is urgent. We need to find a, a permanent repository for this, for this stuff because we're going to keep generating it, and we have no place to put it right now. And the Yucca Mountain study has, should continue, in my opinion. Um, you know, when the law says it, it should be, but it, it probably is the best solution that we have right now. Um, if you think about all the work that's going in, and this process started in, what, 1987, and we're in 2015, um, the work, the money that's been spent, it definitely deserves a full look. And if not, if that's not the site for whatever reason, then we need other solutions. Um, Australia has tossed around the idea of basically building a uh, global repository in the outback where they would, for a service fee, accept um, spent fuel and high level radioactive waste from around the world. Um, yeah, it's an interesting idea. The outback's pretty rugged. Um, how are you going to get there? It's a long trip. Uh, it's a dangerous trip. So, and then I know there's some other theories out there, but that's it. Any questions? <coughs> Couple of thoughts on the waste um, process, and nice, nicely described here. Um, one of the prospective contenders two years plus ago. Uh, looked like it might be southern New Mexico, where the defense departments, here's where we're going to store waste not as toxic as the uh, spent fuel, but still you've got to keep this out, uh, was all set up. They had been operating for about 15 years. A lot of the southern New Mexico population down there, town of Carlsbad particularly, very interested in, uh, well, if Yucca Mountain is out, we'd be interested in talking about it, and we've proven that we can done it that we can do it. And then, uh, you know, a year ago, Valentine's Day, they had a release of some of the material down there, and you've uh, maybe seen some of the newspaper talk of, well, we had one of the ingredients that we were using to store some of this was the equivalent of kitty litter, and that had a bad chemical reaction possibility, and that looked like what caused this. And they, are, they have still not taken any new shipments in since then. 
And the latest estimate that I've seen, and they keep doing study, 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 is it may be a $500 million process to get that facility back just to where it was, let alone talking about do we then jump ahead and take anything else in. Um, the, other, uh, the other piece with the political change of things, there was, uh, I think, last, last week's Economist magazine saying with Harry Reid's departure from the Senate, he is not going to run again when he comes up. Uh, the Economist was virtually ready to say, well, that means Yucca Mountain is back in. A major blocking person has now disappeared from the leadership of the Democratic Party. I think it very well could be. I mean, he yeah. was a, my, I, my dad actually lives in Henderson, Nevada, which yeah. is a suburb of Las Vegas, and so I'm quite familiar with uh, Nevada. And, uh, you know, he was extremely powerful um, senator from there. And, uh, you know, I... You know, I was thinking about this. I actually, right now, I have a younger brother and sister, you know, 8 and 12. You know, I do, would not have a problem with them going to school, you know, 100 miles southwest of a repository. Um, in terms of the accidents, yeah, it's happened. Um, and I know that's not a great answer for something like nuclear. But if, even if you look at Fukushima and you look at uh, Three Mile Island, how many deaths occurred? Yeah. No. Um, so the safety protocols are getting better. The, they're going to keep getting better. And I think at the end of the day, um, we're going to have to make a decision where to put this. And I don't think the solution is what we have now. Yeah. And it's been fun how some of the big game changers in the rest of the energy realm uh, comes along. Mid-1990s, if you were saying, what's the future of nuclear power? Probably 90% of people have said it's it's going to fade away. Well, we won't shut it down immediately, but we will plants that are there, we'll live out their useful lives, they may get renewed for another 20 year period, but then nobody is going to build any new ones. We've got other ways of doing it, there's enough that's scary out there. And what was the big thing that then came along and changed that to pro-nuclear? Climate change. Oh my goodness, if we're serious about this, we're putting too much carbon CO2 in the atmosphere from coal, from petroleum, from natural gas, what's the one 24-7-365 well already established how you can produce large amounts of electricity? That's nuclear. And there's no other contender really in that field. So, oh, maybe we're too quick about giving up on nuclear. And then you roll on another 10 years, mid-2005 you know, such, nuclear starting, the nuclear renaissance supposedly starting back. And then what happens 2005 coming on? Fracking! We've suddenly got much more natural gas, much more petroleum in the United States, and if our worry is foreign supplies and running out of the stuff, and the cost, that's not the problem anymore. Ooh, nuclear suddenly gets less popular. So it's a up and down and up and down. Any other questions? Um, any? Did you read anything about what, like the, I guess, likelihood of anyone trying to use the positioning of those nuclear plants? Like, since they're near metropolitan areas, like what the likelihood of someone trying to attack those areas is? Or... <laughs> I didn't That's read specifically concern. on like the like you know I didn't find literature on the likelihood of uh, you know specific attack on the metropolitan area. Just something that I came up with. Um, but I I think in this day and age, um, the digital <coughs> aspect that you brought up earlier, I think is a lot more pertinent than maybe a heart attack on one of the facilities. Uh, unless you could, I mean, a heart attack would be, would be good if you have the winds growing in the right direction and you could. Put it, you know, but in terms of the sophistication to handle the materials, in terms of if they wanted to make like a dirty bomb or something, I don't think that that would be particularly feasible. But I think the digital, um, the digital aspect is, is very pertinent right now. And it's a further fun piece of how much public disclosure you, do you want of all kinds of energy information, and. Uh, Again, you know, good environmentalist, good advocate for public involvement and everything says, let's get as much of that information out and we'll put it up on a website and anybody who wants to check in can do that. Um, now, terrorism concerns, I'm not real sure that you want to have 
here is the map of where you can find all United States nuclear facilities and what some of their vulnerabilities might be. Yeah, and very bright tourists or are, are te terrorists are out there saying, oh, okay, let's how you know, we work with that. Yeah, and even expanding off of that, if you have yeah. Google Earth or you know, Google Maps, uh, you can get right you know, down to the very minutia of the planets and so yeah. again security concerns. And you can you can also look at, you know, I know you were talking about the British nuclear deterrent. Yeah. You can zoom into their in submarine base in Scotland as well. Yeah. Same with France. Um, so yeah, the technology is a, is a big concern. Mm -hmm. And what to disclose and what not to. Last questions? I have one, one there. there. Um, it's hard to wrap your head around how many metric tons of waste there are. Did you see your information regarding um, projections of Yucca Mountain six miles long? Would it even be able to have the capacity to store the existing waste, or how many years of waste could it store? How long? Yeah, you know, I, I don't remember that off the top of my head, but I, I do feel that, and Professor, feel free to chime in if you know. Um, I think the capacity is pretty good. Although I think the perception is we will need another one if we continue operating the present nuclear or expand it. And so that also gets exciting uh, for everybody. I don't want it in my state. Uh, well, we may not be done with that just because we stick it to Nevada. And I confess I would love to be a political groupie out in the Nevada primary next year as candidates are coming through, and I suspect they need to have a very careful answer to big question on all Nevadans' minds. You mentioned France you obviously uses a lot. It's kind of the, the general consensus on that. But it, what are they doing with their waste? Do they have a repository, or is it? You know, I actually don't know. Really. Part is they reprocess, Repro and that reduces the amount of it rather considerably. They are looking, and I think they're well ahead of where the United States is, and maybe the other two countries. Sweden and Finland uh, doing fairly well and thinking we're going to get the underground as safe as we can, geology looks good for it, repository. And the wonderful quote from one, uh, I think, Finnish uh, scientist saying, all this talk about, you know, million years of safe storage we need in order to make this thing work. Uh, he says, yeah, this stuff has been, you know, the geology has been there for billions of years. We can handle that. Man, that's maybe more confident than I would be, but uh, you might say it's more regional the solution, eventually, yeah. you know, the European Union. Yeah, I'd love to love to track it that way. Further questions? Please. Thank you both. Well.